Yeah. Okay. We can go to Melissa. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Melissa from Transparency International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Charles. Are you there? Charles Masangira. Okay, then we can go to Hilda. Hilda, are you there? We can move to James Chapa. Are you there, James? I'm saying this is Charles Masangira. Yeah, so I'm not I'm around here. Okay. Can we James Chapa? Hi, Chas my name is Hi. James Chapa. I'm from uh, Muslim for Human Rights Muhuri from Kilifi County. Thank you. We can move to Judith or Dutch. Are you there, Judith? Yes, I'm in. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Maybe you can tell us your institution. I'm from the Civil Society Urban Development Platform, that is CSUDP. Thank you, thank you. We have uh, Lydian. Are you there? Uh, then we can move to Wades Mwangi. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Wallace Mwangi. I'm from PISA. Thank you, Mr. Wades. We can move to Christine. Christine, are you there? If uh, Christine is not around, we can move to Mariam. Mariam, are you there? Okay, then I think uh, for the sake of time, uh, I want us to start our discussion today. So we have um, the format that we're going to adopt for this is that we are going to have um, some presentation or some overview with um, being uh, given by my colleague, Titus Zogado, uh, who just made some introduction a few minutes ago. Uh, Titus uh, works with Transparency International as a program coordinator for the public accountability program. And he has an uh, interest in policy advocacy and legislative transformation for good governance. We then have um, some uh, our key discussant, who is uh, Irene Otieno, an advocate of the High Court and also the national coordinator of um, NTA, National Taxpayers Association. Then we have a plenary to get feedback from us as um, participants. And I think um, our key role in this discussion will be looking at uh, corruption, leadership, and the BBI process. And maybe to start us off, um, I would like to adopt the words of uh, Professor Yash, Yash Fagai when he reiterated the importance of the constitution, the need to, for us as citizens to understand the constitution or the need of it, including the very basic rights that um, we should be enjoying, without which, without this understanding, I don't think we are, we are in a position to help others. And it can also mean that we'll be denied, a few of us, Kenyans will deny us an opportunity to express ourselves and to enjoy this. And it's interesting to see whether BBI gives us this option or limits our, limits our enjoyment of the rights. So I want to start off with the welcoming Titus to take us through an overview of uh, corruption, leadership and the BBI process, after which we have our Irene Otieno take it up. Thank you, Titus. 
Thanks a lot, Komo, for that introduction and, of course, for making us feel home and uh, giving us that well-guided direction on how we need to proceed. Um, I'm happy to be in this discussion, and I will just wish to also point out as we begin um, that I also enjoyed a lot the opening session by Dr. Muta Kangu. Already he has given us um, very critical insight and what I also picked out as some of the very critical uh, aspects that we need to carry on within the discussion. May I also point out that in our reflections around BBI and matters of leadership and, 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 and fighting corruption, we also want to be very much open-minded with the proposals as captured in the BBI. We are not attempting to make a particular hardline position on, on the document, but rather we are leaving it, uh, we are very much going into the discussion very much open-minded as to the proposals, areas where we feel there could be risks and where we feel there could be opportunities. And therefore, I just want to make it clear from the beginning that this is not about um, us having a particular position on BBI, but having a reflection based on what we know. May I also point out that from the discussion that we're supposed to be having, uh, corruption is a cross-cutting issue. And from our review of the document, we decided to look at it in a holistic manner. And what we uh, noted is that some of these issues are, are really affecting both national government and county government as a whole. And therefore we'll dive into the discussion with a, a lot more focus on corruption generally and, and where necessary, we'll be pointing out specific aspects that touch on, on devolution as per the theme of our discussion. And having said that, um, I will um, just give you a general overview of how I plan to take you through this discussion. Number one, uh, as Transparency International Kenya, obviously most of you I believe have interacted with us and probably you know what we do. Our area of focus is in the fight against corruption. This is something that we've been doing and this is something that we do. And we use various strategies in terms of fighting corruption. And therefore, over the years, we have always uh, tracked the progress of our country in terms of the fight against corruption. And even in terms of this kind of critical process, including the constitutional making process, we had our views around what needed to be factored in to ensure that the fight against corruption is Strengthened. And therefore, with that background, we are ensuring we are going to start from giving our thinking on what we believe are critical aspects or critical elements that needs to be considered for strengthening the fight against corruption. Yeah, so I was just outlining that in terms of the discussions, I would wish just to point out uh, what we believe are some of the critical areas that needs to be considered in terms of strengthening the fight against corruption. After outlining those areas which we believe are some of the critical areas that needs to be strengthened, then we'll proceed and share what we have noted from the BBI as uh, some of the proposals uh, in the BBI document or in terms of fighting corruption. And then from there, we'll also share what we feel are some of the pros and cons or maybe risks and opportunities based on those proposals. And then from there, we will welcome now uh, Irene to help us now put some of those discussions into perspective, also share additional thoughts. And then now we can open the discussion for the rest of us now to reflect together as a team before we feed back into the discussion. So um, diving into the first aspect of my discussion, just highlighting some of the things we feel needs to be factored in, in the fight against corruption to strengthen the fight against corruption as TI Kenya. We want to start from appreciating the fact that most Kenyans and we all know that corruption has been a big challenge. And from some of the surveys and the studies that we have done in terms of Kenyans' performance in the fight against corruption, from our um, indices, it has always been not very promising and, and not very encouraging. And therefore, corruption is a real challenge. And even from this very document that today we are having discussions on, they note that most of the Kenyans in terms of their outputs really also indicated the concern 
that corruption is a major issue that threatened the prosperity of Kenya and needed to be given a lot of attention. And with that, over the years, as TI Kenya, we have pointed out what we believe are some of the key five areas that needs to be considered looking at Kenya's background and looking at the, 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 the context of corruption generally, that anybody having a discussion on strengthening the fight against corruption in Kenya needs to look into. These issues are the following. Number one, we believe that to help in addressing what we see as endemic corruption and what we see as a corruption that has been threatening our virtually all five of the society in a decisive action. One of those things that needs to be considered is to cons look at the issue of misconduct of and lack of political goodwill as manifested in the lack of adherence to the rule of law and institution that needs to be strengthened. So anybody having a conversation around strengthening the fight against corruption needs to have a very um, insightful discussion around that. How do we ensure that we get the political goodwill and ensure that the rule of law guides our processes in terms of the fight against corruption? That has been a key area of concern over the years as we fight corruption. And even as we look at the BPI report, we are looking at it from that lens. To what extent is the report looking at this particular angle? That is one of the aspects. The second aspect that we have always uh, fronted as an area of interest to look at in the terms of strengthening the fight against corruption is the issue around um, upholding the procedures and ensuring that the policies, the legal framework and the institutional frameworks that are put in place are really upheld by all in the country. That cuts across from right from the citizens to the duty bearers. And this is one of the areas that we feel has been a key area of concern over the years, including the implementation of the constitution that we gave unto ourselves in, in a very rich manner. The other area that we have always talked about in terms of strengthening the fight against corruption is ensuring that we deal with uncoordinated overlaps among the institutions that are supposed to be helping helping us in the fight against corruption. We feel that as, as much as we have made some strides in creating the requisite institutions and ensuring that these institutions are helping us in the fight against corruption, sometimes there are overlaps among these institutions that are undermining the very fight against corruption that they are supposed to be helping us deal with. And that to us is an area that we have always said, anybody wishing to strengthen the fight against corruption needs to pay attention to that area. And lastly, the other area that we have always pointed out is ensuring that we also look at uh, some of the loopholes in some of our laws and policies that we need to tighten to ensure that we don't have lacunas or gaps in the law that allow merchants of corruption to utilize those gaps in our law for purposes of uh, perpetuating corruption. So for us, we believe those critical areas, if looked into, we should be in a position to turn the tide against the corruption, which has become a critical challenge. And as we were looking at BBI report, we looked at it with those lenses because we believe those are some of the key aspects that needs to be considered. And having said that, in our review of the BBI report, we noted the following as general comments before we go into the substantive aspect of it. Number one, even as we are proceeding to consume the information, it is important to note that the BBI proposals uh, were cross-cutting around policy, legal framework, and approaches. And if you look at the BBI report, uh, from the angle of fighting corruption, there were two largely key areas that you need to look into. Number one are the proposed policies that needs to be put in place and also what they are proposed as the values that those policies need to consider. And then um, juxtapose those with what we need to ensure that those policies contain to tighten the fight against corruption. And, and also, they have also gone ahead in the report to propose some of the administrative aspects that needs to be considered in terms of 
um, helping in the fight against corruption. So we looked at both aspects of the legal and policy proposals. And also we looked at some of the administrative proposals in terms of strengthening the fight against corruption. It's also important to emphasize at this point that when we are looking at these, we need to remember that in the fight against corruption, there is no silver bullet that we can use. And as long as we are using isolated policy reforms, we are less likely to succeed in the fight against corruption. So it is always important to ensure that we have an entire system of political, institutional, and administrative ecosystem that be, must be very conducive to ensure that we win against the fight against corruption. So as long as we're having these isolated policy reforms, we are not likely to succeed in turning the tide in matters of fighting corruption in the country. And this is something that we also paid attention to as we were looking at the report. And something that we also noted from the earlier opening of the session from Dr. Mukar Kango report uh, remarks is that they are definitely political and legal implications as we look at this document. And therefore, even as we are going to review some of these, let us all pay attention in a very objective manner to some of the political and legal implications that we've been and listening to and hearing all over the period. And some of them, and I liked how Dr. Tari put it, he said clearly that those misunderstanding and the mixing of those issues might actually cloud the entire process moving forward. And that is a gap that needs also to be addressed. And from all these um, observations that we have made, I, I think it is important we carry those in, into our reflections. Now, um, moving into now some of the details on the areas we looked into what BBI is proposing. Again, I will look at them in divided uh, framework of what are the proposed policy and legal frameworks. I will also look at some of the uh, approaches and strategies that have been proposed generally from the report. And then also look at some of the areas around value systems, ethos, architecture, good governance and accountability. And then also there were some proposals around prosecution and judicial processes. Those are also some of the key areas that we thought if we look at the some of the proposals along those areas, we could then be able to understand some of the proposals that the BBI uh, report is proposing in terms of dealing with corruption. Uh, number one, um, in terms of the legal and policy framework, some of us might remember a while back that there was a report that was commissioned by the AG that was helping in, term, in terms of reviewing the policy, institutional and legal framework in, in terms of helping strengthen the fight against corruption. We hold the opinion that that report was very, very good it did quite a bit of good review and did a bit of comprehensive review of policy and legal framework. And that takes me back to what I said earlier on, that there is always a lot of importance in ensuring that we do a very coordinated and a holistic, not a selected a review of policies which might not yield as much results. And therefore we felt that this report ought to have been given a lot of attention in the BI, in the BBI processes and uh, recommendations in, in terms of helping us strengthen the fight against corruption. Uh, the other area that um, we also looked at as we were reviewing is just the implementation of the constitution, especially on leadership and integrity act. And anybody who wants to strengthen the fight against corruption, that is one of the key areas that needs to be looked into. Not all, but one of the key areas, leadership integrity, because most of the challenges that we have had in this country in terms of the fight against corruption stems a lot more from the deficits and the lack of integrity in our operations and lack of proper leadership that can steer us towards the fight against corruption. So that is also something that we were also very keen on as we were reviewing the, the report. And then also in terms of approaches and strategies, we were also keen on ensuring that we look at what are some of these proposals that are being uh, recommended by BBI to ensure that there is a bit of coordinated 
there is a bit of well thought out um, proposal to give us some sort of political goodwill, give us some sort of um, administrative reforms that will propel the fight against corruption. So that is also another area that we paid attention to. So having said that, um, may I point out some of the proposals that we singled out from the BBI report that we think needs our reflection in terms of uh, opportunities and possibly the risks. Number one, I believe that Having reviewed the document, the BBI report, my conclusion, and this is something that it would be interesting to hear the thoughts of the participants, is that there are very limited aspects in terms of substantive uh, proposals to amend the constitution that came from this report. If you look at the proposals that they made, they are very limited proposal in terms of some which will warrant um, uh, amendment of the constitution. But they have given a lot of proposals, which some of them are very, very good and, and very, very insightful administrative proposals that we need to look into for us to ensure that we turn the tide against corruption. So the first observation that I make looking at this report is that there is a lot more to do with administrative aspects that we need to do as a country to turn the tide against corruption as opposed to legal and policy transformations. But also they have given some policy related proposals that needs to be considered. Of course, these areas needs to be further be developed. The framers of the report note that they could not have enough time to substantively develop those policies. Among those policies that they are proposed that I feel and we note are critical in matters fighting corruption include the policy to clean and ensure effective government. In that proposal, that policy proposal, they are indicating that within the civil service, there has been a lot of challenges in, in terms of how the officers and the, the various um, points of service delivery do have a challenge. And this has created a situation where citizens uh, normally do not get services because of this particular uh, bureaucracies and, and, and a lack of ethics, lack of professionalism that needs to be done and eventually create a situation of having now the, the cartels in the government. So to address that, they're proposing to have some kind of a national policy to clean up and ensure effective government. Another policy proposal they are having is a national policy on combating impunity. And again, they have uh, propose that uh, from their discussions with the citizens and Kenyans, there were a lot of uh, dissatisfaction uh, that most people see impunity as a greatest challenge, especially in subordination of the rule of law, that most of the um, uh, government officers and, 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 and those we need to be looking out for, for service delivery, normally use those positions to subvert the rule of law and therefore use those positions for the self-interest. So the issue of impunity, they have proposed a, a policy framework that needs to be uh, put in place for combating impunity. Another policy framework they have proposed is on public participation and access to information issues that needs to bolster uh, some of the challenges that we have been having around uh, public participation, just to ensure that the public are put at the center of our governance processes, so that that in itself is supposed to help us propel our service delivery in, in terms of transparency and accountability. So looking at those proposals, which are largely uh, progressive, they are proposals that need not necessarily require amendment of the constitution from our view and from our look of things. And those are some of the areas that um, we noted in terms of a policy and legal framework that they, they, uh, they had proposed. In terms of the legal um, aspects, um, uh, specific amendments that they proposed, there was a proposal and one of the areas that I we picked out as needs a very robust conversation is the proposal to transform the system of parliament. And there are 
they were proposing to have a hybrid system of presidential and parliamentary system. Now, that is the kind of proposal that definitely uh, will fundamentally change the, the constitution and that definitely will require a discussions around uh, amendment of the constitution. But then the question that we need to be having, and this for us as TI Kenya is a fundamental area of discussion in the fight against corruption. And maybe if I elaborate a bit on it is the discussion that have been going on around this is that is having the government in parliament a lot more effective in terms of fighting corruption than the kind of system that we currently have where the government is outside parliament. And this has been a very robust conversation. The proponents of that mixed parliamentary system hold the view that in a hybrid system where you have the government in parliament, you tend to deal with the fight against corruption a lot better as opposed to when you don't have now, for example, the ministers and the cabinet secretaries in parliament. And that is a discussion that we may want to pursue further. If you look at also the scholars that have reviewed this particular discussion, there is always a credit to the fact that if you have a mixed system where you have government in parliament, then there is always a tendency to reduce the level of corruption. That is debatable, but that is something that most people favor that bit of opinion in terms of the fight against corruption. It is something that will be very interesting to hear. That is one of the fundamental issues that we noted in terms of the BBI proposal in terms of fighting corruption that may require um, redesigning or amending the constitution not the policies that I mentioned earlier on. And, and, and I encourage you, it will be very interesting to hear the, the input from our discussant Irene Nutiano on this. There are scholars like Joel Bakran that have argued that if you have parliament in the house, there is always a good outcome. But the catch is this. If you look at the kind of system that we currently have and what the MPs have always said is that Whenever they summon the cabinet secretaries to come and answer questions in parliament, they normally tend to ignore and choose not to obey. When that kind of thing happens, it undermines the parliamentary authority in terms of enforcing accountability and transparency and thereby weakens the fight against corruption. But also there has always been the argument that parliament is given the powers equivalent to the high court. And therefore they can actually issue arrest warrants to the people who do not adhere to the summons by parliament. So the question has always been, why don't they use that? And to what extent have they used that to ensure that we do not therefore complain that we are issuing summons, they are not obeying, and therefore we need to be, we need to have them appointed from the house. That is an area that we noted as a fundamental area of discussion that we need to have. Again, another legislative area of conversation that uh, the BBI has, has, has proposed, and those in my view are the two key ones, is on um, Article 80 in the amendments, in the, in the proposed amendments, uh, they are talking about um, amending the Article 8. Um, Article 30, 30, 30, 36 of the Constitution also, um, and particularly on Article 80, they are inserting a new paragraph uh, to ensure that there is expeditious investigation, prosecution, and trial relating to matters of leadership and integrity. That is the import of that uh, proposal. But the question is, uh, to what extent is that going to bring any revolutionary or decisive action. In any case, must we amend that to ensure that we have expeditious invest investigation and prosecution of corruption cases? That is something that we need to interrogate because that is one of the proposals that they are also making as far as the constitution is amending the constitution is concerned. Also, there is also um, I'm, I'm amending Article 171 of the constitution. And this has to do with the independence of judiciary. This has been a, a, a big discussion. And some of you, I'm aware you've been part of this discussion, looking at the, 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 the way uh, judiciary is framed. Uh, to what extent is, is that 
uh, proposal to have judiciary ombudsman going to strengthen or weaken a judiciary. And for us, we feel any particular move on judiciary that will be perceived to be weakening judiciary has a direct consequence on the fight against corruption because the independence of judiciary in line with the principle of separation of powers is a critical principle that always helps in strengthening good governance for us to ensure the fight against corruption is upheld. So that is the other area that we also picked as a fundamental area of proposal in terms of um, amending the constitution that we picked. The other area that I noted, but I also realized that Dr. Tari also picked was on the proposal around to amend Article 225 on financial controls, which gives cabinet secretary a responsible for finance to stop the transfer of funds to state organs. At the face value of it, just like Dr. Tari lightly noted, I had also indicated this as an area that requires robust conversation. It might appear as a robust mechanism of ensuring that we deal with wastages or we control resources. But in our experience in the fight against corruption, if you give a lot of undiscretionary power equivalent to this, then the tendencies are that you may not necessarily be addressing that problem. You are simply transferring the issues of temptation and compromising that particular person through other quarters to still perpetuate the very, very corruption that we are trying to deal with by enforcing that. So that is an area that we also noted that requires a bit of a reflection in terms of how it helps us deal with um, strengthening the fight against corruption. So largely in terms of policy and legislative proposals that are in the document, those are the critical what I would call top line proposal that we need to reflect on, but of course there are others. But other than that, there are then administrative proposals that were given. And that is an area that I will be concluding with as I open up the discussion uh, first starting with, with, with Irene. I mentioned earlier on that if you look at the proposal in the BBI report, a lot of the proposals they have given particularly on the aspects of leadership and anti-corruption has to do with administrative aspects and not largely on policy and legislative aspects. And that also tells you, in my view, that from anti-corruption lens, the, 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 the BBI report to a large extent seems to tell us that for matters corruption, therefore, what we need to focus on is matters of implementing the constitution and the current legislative framework, because a lot of the proposals has to do with the administrative aspects and not much more on policy and legislative reforms. The only place where it has a fundamental and substantive proposal is the question of probably representation and also the question of having a mix sort of gov bringing government into parliament. And of course, I want to just emphasize that when we talk about bringing government into parliament, let us let us not um, uh, confuse that with uh, proposing that it is okay now to have those other proposed positions. No, it is just the question of where we pick these other the ministers that we are talking about. So, if you look at the administrative proposals, they have come up with a number of proposals which, in my view, are very progressive and needs to be strengthened. And this proposed administrative proposals uh, can actually help us a lot more in addressing some of the, the, the challenges that we have seen. Number one, they have given proposals on uh, the cartel capture issue that they're talking about. And they are seeing how there needs to be a strengthening of the processes, a strengthening of the NIS to do a lot of um, uh, surveillance, ensuring that we work closely with the central bank to withdraw licenses and heavy penalties on bank executives that are supposed to be helping money laundering and also uh, having uh, push facilitators of tax evasion and all this. And obviously, the, 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 the recognition in my view and interpretation of these uh, administrative proposals is that already the current policy and, 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 and legal architecture that we have can already help us if they are well implemented, these administrative proposals can well be embedded within our existing 
policy and legal framework without necessarily having to talk about the amendment of the constitution. So that is one of the areas that they have proposed and we largely concur that this administrative proposal is good. The other second area of administrative proposal as far as anti-corruption is concerned is using prevention and deterrence to counter corruption. And there, they have really talked about the questions about um, education and enhancing the ethos and the ethics generally among the public. And that is something that we see as a critical element. They have also uh, talked about the, the need to ensure that whistleblowers are protected and we utilize the Office of Witness Protection Program uh, properly. And those are areas that even as we have been all along um, talking about in terms of strengthening for us to help uh, uh, boosting the fight against corruption. So these administrative areas of proposal largely in, in our view are very progressive and they can help a lot in turning the tide against corruption. And I just want to conclude by saying that having a review of the entire report, a lot of the proposal as far as anti-corruption measures are concerned has to do with administrative proposal but less on uh, policy and legislative um, uh, policy a proposal, particularly on the amendment of the constitution. And from our review, the fundamental area that will warrant a discussion around amending the constitution has to do with altering the architecture of the legislature, which again is subject to a very robust conversation. Ultimately, we can alter and make all this good policy and legal uh, proposals. The other underlying challenge that we've always had, as I conclude, has always been implementing those very legal and policy frameworks that we have had. And the BBI report does not in any way give assurance or guarantee to what extent are these also proposals now going to address the question of lack of implementation of our progressive policy and legal frameworks. And also, dealing with the question of political goodwill. That again is also not very much addressed, which leaves us the question as to, to what extent therefore some of these proposals will be implemented. I beg to stop there because of time. Those are the top notch areas that we picked to help us have a discussion to what extent this BBI document is helping us push the fight against corruption and turn it back to Komu as we welcome Irene to further give us a bit of insights, reflection on this subject area. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you for not, uh, Titus for that uh, elaborate um, overview of uh, some of the issues that are coming out as far as uh, this topic is concerned, corruption, leadership, and the BBI, the Building Bridges Initiative. I think uh, there are key issues that are coming out. And I think for us, the biggest concern is where are we coming from and where are we headed? Does uh, this BBI offer solutions that are going to change uh, how we've been doing things or how the fight against uh, graft, corruption, and the leadership issues that have been uh, coming up now and then? We are aware that uh, we have so many case, corruption cases that are still in court. We are yet to see um, ideas, we are yet to see results, even from the initiatives that have been um, uh, started by the president, we still feel there are gaps as far as the fight against corruption is concerned. We still question our conscience as a people around uh, the kind of leaders that we have uh, decided uh, to give the mandate. And therefore, it's important that we discuss what are these proposals that are being brought uh, across by BBI? Do they offer a solution or we are just trying to shift goalposts uh, around the whole issue of corruption and leadership? And uh, probably to remind us, our role as a group or, or even as the general team that was in the other meeting or before we broke to this uh, session, we need to get a better understanding of um, corruption, leadership, and BBI. Some of the proposals that are made, being made in the BBI, the gaps that are there, 
We also need uh, to be clear on our role as CSOs and even citizens, as far as um, this topic is concerned. And of great, also, of great importance is um, how then do we move forward with public awareness from this space that we are in, a civil society, how do we then take this conversation to citizens for them to be able to understand some of these provisions to enable them make um, an informed decision even as we move forward with the BBI process. Uh, maybe to point out, uh, it's been a journey. They are starting from uh, repealing of uh, section 2A. We came to the referendum, then there was a uh, the BBI initiative was born where the president and uh, the ODM leader came up with issues they felt uh, affecting the nation. Key among them is corruption, devolution. We have uh, national ethos. We have a uh, negative ethnicity and uh, there is also divisive election. So the question, uh, we might not be able to deal with all this but we can see corruption and devolution as key issues that they felt are some of the problems that we are having. And I must say, I'm sure we all agree that corruption is an issue in this country. As for a national conversation, whether this was taken out there for us as a people to decide whether this is all that is the problem we are having. I think uh, that is something we are picking up. And I also say we are also learning to, to get into the BBI conversation because we can't afford to miss it now that we already have it with us. And so to take us through a detection of some of the issues that are coming out on the BBI proposals that are being made, maybe as remedy to the issue that has been corruption leadership. I would like to welcome um, Irene Otieno, uh, the national coordinator for national taxpayers position, and also an advocate of the high court, to probably take us through some of the issues that are coming up. Maybe even to start with Madam Irene, we, what is the challenge? I think we have had that conversation, that question as we are, were leaving the other main group. What is the problem that we are trying to address with BBI, specifically looking at corruption, leadership, and even ethics? And is chapter six and even the constitution that we have now, or oh, does it lack in, um, systems and even uh, the provisions to address what we are trying to address with BBI and more around the issues that uh, my colleague Titus has highlighted. Irene, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, friends, uh, I'm really happy and uh, uh, honored to uh, be a discussant in this uh, uh, very timely conversation. Of course, I'm interested first as a citizen of Kenya who definitely is greatly worried about the states and really the growing size and the sheer size and the audacity uh, of corruption in Kenya. So any solution uh, put on the table is something that would elicit interest from citizens, CSO, media, and the like. And so this conversation, I'm sure, is one that other citizens are also having in other quarters. But uh, just by way of introduction, thank you. I think you have let everyone know uh, who I am, Asante, for that. And I can see friends that we have worked with for long. So in light of, uh, of the time we have, and I'd also just need guidance on how long uh, I have so that we also give time for uh, the other ones on, in, in this group. So any guidance, how long should I take on this, please? So Irene, you can have um, about uh, 25 minutes. Okay. Then we can have 25 minutes for the plenary session as we also wind up on the session. Santi, Thank I think you. that is uh, fairly uh, a lot. I can be able to donate some. So uh, for me, looking at uh, the BBI document, I see a lot of issues uh, not directly linked to corruption. But if you look at it the, uh, and draw linkages, you can see that the whole conversation really, as you're asking what question are we trying to address, 
With the BBI, I'm looking at uh, one nation and the issues of shared prosperity that has already been uh, highlighted in the document. So how do we uh, as uh, Kenyan citizens feel like we own a stake in our country and are then able to defend it to the core? Uh, uh, the other issues linking up with it obviously are important, but for me at a personal level, I think that is the core. How do we, if we address uh, some of the issues here, would be able to appeal to people's sense of uh, nationalism to their country? And so when you look at uh, this document, I see a lot of conversations first on uh, how do we raise uh, revenue? Uh, remember from uh, Dr. Mutai Kag uh, Kagu's uh, presentation, a key issue in which he felt, and I, I think all of us feel, is a, an increase in the percentage of uh, resources that would go to devolved units. So that is one, but in essence, when you go back to the conversation around uh, corruption, if we do not address corruption, even that uh, uh, noble uh, uh, recommendation will really not go forward. So it then shows that we must address this if we want to safeguard uh, devolution. So for me, devolution cannot, we cannot speak uh, of it only in the context of more resources, but how do we safeguard those resources? And secondly, uh, looking at uh, this document, there is also conversation around uh, expanding the tax base. So you see, these are some of the issues that Kenyans have been grappling with and their concern then if we are saying that uh, other sections of the BBI are pushing to issues of a nationhood. How do you feel as a, uh, as a Kenyan that you are, because we've said uh, the corruption is at two levels. So a lot of uh, highlight has been corruption that is uh, with the political class. But we remember that this corruption is also perpetuated by private sector players in business, the ordinary uh, Mwananchi also. So uh, the feeling then is if you overtax also a citizen, then there is always, you overtax and you do not provide services, then you cannot appeal to someone's sense of nationalhood and then appeal to them and say that do not, uh, uh, you know, do not get into these issues of corruption. So how we as a country then are able even to address the tax, uh, tax raising mechanisms has then an impact on uh, uh, nation nationalism and then consequently the issues around corruption. So that I just wanted to draw a bit of linking to say that the document is really rich in terms of uh, how it, it, it uh, would want us to address the problem. But when we are squarely looking at corruption, I think uh, some of the proposals in this document have not gotten uh, the real gist of the problem. So first, uh, uh, and I like what uh, Tait has presented in terms of policy and legal frameworks, I think we are at a good place, not the best place, if you look comparat uh, comparatively with other, other jurisdictions. So in terms of the basic uh, laws, uh, the constitution itself is very clear. It states what needs to be done. It states, if you completely look at the, uh, at the chapter on uh, PFM, it's very clear how public money should be spent and safeguards around it. It then goes further to legislate with the, the Public Finance Management Act a public Audit Act and a raft of other legislation, how we can address uh, corruption. But if you take stock of, uh, of the, those pieces of legislation and the constitution itself, then you find that we are falling short on uh, the implementation, which I would say is not anything new. We have known, I think even from the morning discussion, it has been highlighted that implementation is the issue. Titus has also uh, uh, you know, hammered it in. So how do we then move from this or how do we address the issue of implementation? And I would say that there's a bit of an attempt at the, uh, in the BBI document where they are uh, proposing that we need to uh, uh, improve the capacity of the investigative agencies then to address corruption. And they make reference to the DCI, they make reference to the Office of the uh, Public Prosecution which in my observation in the last one or so years, there's really been a lot of progress from that end. So in terms of, uh, uh, of saying that we, we strengthen these institutions, I would be more keen to see what exactly are we proposing to strengthen them uh, with. Uh, for me, I have seen the capacity has, has greatly, uh, and, uh, and allow me to mention at times, it really isn't about the law or the institution itself, as we are now discussing the DCI, but the person occupying 
that, uh, uh, that, that, that office. Remember, we have still had the office of the ODPP before the current uh, office holder was in, but we hadn't seen as much action as we are seeing now. So then that also uh, brings us to that conversation that it isn't the law, it also depends on the person that you, you have in those offices. Because the, 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 the office has currently constituted, it has expansive powers to do what it must do. So the question is why was the previous office bearer not doing what we are seeing now? And obviously you'd have the issues of uh, uh, political interference. And these are things that you cannot legislate on sometimes, but things that we need to find additional ways of, of going through. So in terms of addressing corruption, that is one key thing I have seen proposed in the BBI, only to say that going deeper on how this is done uh, is what has not been clearly uh, outlined. I'm sure probably we wouldn't want to have a very, uh, they wouldn't put everything here, but I'm hoping that is an area that we as civil society organizations can be able to support these offices. I have seen a lot of donor interest also in this regard. How do we support the investigative agencies? However, uh, uh, just linking it in again, even when we are looking at the corruption that these institutions that are proposed in the BBI are to look at, we have to be alive to the challenges that they face. The nature of corruption has taken a very bold face. It has taken a, a multi-jurisdictional approach. So uh, the proceeds or the, the, the crime itself happens here in Kenya, but wherever the funds go are start outside the country. So what is the legal and international framework that facilitates repatriation of some of these resources back? How is the asset recovery uh, around some of these issues? And fundamentally the access to information. So even if we strengthen our institutions as a, uh, as a country, what is the landscape at the international level? And I'm happy that there are treaties and there are agreements that Kenya has signed with some of our donor friends, with some of the international, uh, uh, international groups to be able to facilitate this type, of, uh, th this type of corruption that we are seeing. So just to a, a bit add and say that even when we look at our institutions at the country level, then we need to look at the uh, international landscape on how can we really facilitate their access to information in regards to where this money is, how do we facilitate uh, bringing back some of these resources that had left uh, Kenya. The other uh, aspect I see in terms of handling corruption then would be our judiciary, which when I look at uh, the proposals in the BBI, I see uh, an attempt to claw back some of the progress and take us back uh, from some of the progress that the judiciary has made. But generally to say on matters corruption, we have also seen very bold decisions and, and a very good jurisprudence coming out of our courts in regards to uh, corruption. So you remember that most times it, the onus was really on the, on, on the courts and the prosecutors to show that the wealth that someone has does not align with the, uh, probably with the, their pay or you know, the economic activities that they have. But there has been very progressive thinking from the courts where it has then said that if we know your status and what you get and then what we see as assets and the issues that you have are not aligning, then it is for you. The burden then shifts to you as the accused to be able to show that this really is your wealth. So I would say that uh, uh, from the BBI, what I see uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the Ombudsman for the jud uh, Judiciary, that would be clawing back on the independence of this institution. And remember a lot of the corruption interventions, if you strengthen the DCI, you strengthen the ODPP office, all of this, the ESCC, they all find the final place would then be the courts. So if the courts do not have the independence to make the decision, then you can see that even the interventions and the resources uh, that would have been given to the lower end of the investigative agencies, then would really not give the best results that we want. So that is also just a caution that as the document speaks of strengthening one part of the investigative agency in matters corruption, then in another part, it seems then to go against that thinking that it has, uh, uh, it has already started pointing uh, to that direction. Um, just also looking at, I've now mentioned in terms of uh, the judiciary, we have looked at the investigative agencies, but I also see a bit of a gap in terms of how the document approaches uh, corruption. And I think this is where we have also been failing as a, a country. 
there has been, I would say, undue focus on the investigative agencies, but we forget the roles of citizens. Uh, I'm sure most of us in this call uh, would remember uh, the, I think we call it, sorry for that, I think we called it the, the Mara haste. So this was citizens whistleblowing. Uh, people in their, in, you know, in their professional capacity and in the conduct and discharge of their ordinary work, they, they can be able to gain some information that even investigative agencies would not be able to lay their hands on. So how are we addressing that aspect of anti-corruption? Uh, is, there, is there in the BBI, I have seen whistle blowing, how are we ensuring that we, we kind of build this area very much? Is there any incentives for this kind of work to be done by uh, people in their ordinary uh, uh, work? And how can that then support the investigative agencies in this matter? Uh, uh, drawing from the work that we do as an institution, we've had the opportunity to look at uh, a lot of the audit reports from the Office of the Auditor General. You would find that without the uh, facilitation of uh, professionals, be it an engineer, be it a surveyor, be it a banker or a lawyer, there is always a professional behind some of this mega corruption. So if we can then look uh, and address corruption, both being a political and something that professionals do in their ordinary uh, uh, business and try to address that. So how do we incentivize some of the citizens coming out to give information and then how do we protect them? And I'm, I'm, I'm happy I've seen a bit of whistle blowing in the BBI, but I think we really need to see how we as a country leverage on uh, these professional bodies. If it uh, is PAC, we look at the Institute of Engineers and Surveyors, try to show them the amount of money that Kenya is losing in this regard and how uh, their members could be able to assist in way, by, by way of, uh, of whistle blowing. I think that would be something that would make us uh, uh, move on this matter. Uh, I would also want to uh, just add my voice to the issues around uh, public participation that has also been highlighted uh, in the BBI. So uh, on this one, I think the document does not provide something fundamental and uh, something very new. So public participation has, is generally agreed as very useful in governance, but I think there has been a lot of focus of pub on public participation at the point of uh, approving budgets at the point of uh, uh, you know, bills and, uh, and, and discussions, but how do we leverage on this public participation at the point of implementation of projects, at the point of paying some of these projects so that we are sure we are paying things that exist and, and, and uh, not non-existent things. So uh, I, I would say we need to balance. Uh, and now that we have done a, a lot of public participation on the budget process, public participation on uh, legislation and bills that we are trying to push, but how do we leverage on this public participation in terms of then uh, the, the war against uh, uh, corruption? That I think we need to address uh, uh, more. Uh, I would also just uh, want to uh, add my voice to uh, what Titus presented on, I think I, if I got it well, the hybrid uh, uh, parliament. So for me, uh, uh, Kenya gives us both opportunities. We have had in the recent past uh, the system where some of the uh, who are now the cabinet secretaries will still be elected led leaders. And now we have this current scenario. So would we say that uh, having looked at both experiences, was corruption higher then or, uh, or is there a difference? For me, I would, uh, I, I'm a bit hesitant to say that we go the direction of, of the hybrid simply because with this current, we have seen a bit of expertise so that when a cabinet secretary comes on board, of course, uh, with a, a few exceptions, but I would say uh, trying to attract talent outside the political class has some value. The question becomes, is it then that you have to be in the parliament or what is the nature of the parliament itself? In my opinion, parliament and the people therein are the ones that are not holding government to account. They have no excuse. We have already said that parliament has a lot of powers attached to that office. So that power should be, they should be able to wield that power. It shouldn't be that, uh, you know, the, the CS has to be also a, an elected member if, if, I got, if I got what Titus was uh, asking right. 
But uh, also looking at some of the, uh, of, of the reports we have had opportunity to look at, and I still make reference to the Auditor General's report. And this one, I'll give an example of county, but the same applies at national level. So the Auditor General also mentions that, uh, and gives a bad audit report for county assemblies. So this, this means that there isn't integrity within the members as it is, there isn't integrity at that level of, uh, of, of, of that institution. So how then can such an institution be able to oversight the executive? So for me, whether the politician is still the uh, county executive member does not make a difference. The difference first would have to be, do these people have the values that we as a, as a country ascribe to? Uh, second, and uh, almost linked to uh, this other conversation we've always had about when you are giving a parliamentarian who should do oversight, also is doing some level of implementation, either they are managing the county ward the development fund that the BBI is suggesting, or uh, the, the national government CDF. So it muddies the, the waters and the, the, you know, there's a very thin line between, between that. So I think we also must push to have institutions, if it is a parliament at both national and county, they should strictly be uh, oversight institutions. And uh, it would be interesting to see that is this type of scenario peculiar to Kenya only? Or uh, does this, is there value? Because so that we have a bit of a comparative analysis. So is it only in Kenya that you still have someone who should do oversight being also an implementer? And what does that take away from the oversight role? So I, we, we need, before we make a lot of conclusion on this one, but at a personal level, I think it is not right based on the fact of how we have seen some of these funds applied. So uh, that for me would be able to address the issue of the nature of our parliaments, hybrid or not, whichever way we go, first I think would be to distinguish and separate the role of oversight against the role of implementation. Secondly, the values that these people espouse is more important. And I see that is, that, that is, 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 is missing. Um, I would also just want to comment a bit on uh, the article 225 the issue of uh, stoppage of funds. Um, in our opinion, uh, as an institution first, as National Taxpayers Association, we had the uh, opportunity to discuss this even with the, the parliamentarians. Our position when we looked at the, some of the audit reports coming from the Auditor General, we felt like there is a bit of, uh, we might want to explore this as a way, but there was concerns that it might be counterproductive because when you withhold the funds, the citizens who are not party to some of this corruption would be the ones that end up suffering. Uh, so uh, that I think is a still a place that there are different schools of thought that we need to uh, uh, totally understand where everyone is coming from and then why did this provision then find itself first uh, uh, in our constitution as, as, as it currently is. But on the question, on the concern of whether it's discretionary power, I think a reading of the article also just gives a bit, a lot of safeguards before uh, Article 225 is applied, where the controller of budget must give a report and confirm that funds, and there's a lot of corruption and that funds have not been applied well. There's the Office of the Auditor General who needs to add their uh, voice on that, and then Treasury itself also must uh, be able to come in. So for me, it, it, it is something that uh, we need to have conversation as a country about, because the level of corruption we are seeing in this country then calls for concerted efforts and very creative uh, uh, ways of looking at it. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my time, but just allow me one or two uh, minutes before. It's okay, Irene. Yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you. So uh, uh, just looking at it then is how does, uh, what, what for me uh, would be a concern again, how do we leverage and is it only sufficient that we are looking at in-country interventions on corruption? We have had in-country uh, suggestions, in-country legislation and policies for a long time, but the corruption has not gone down, it has actually increased. So what opportunities are there uh, at, the, at both African and East African level in the, uh, at the international forums to be able to uh, help the voice of citizens help the voice of uh, CSOs to demand that our governments become accountable. So for, for me, would also to say that the BBI focused so much on the country level uh, corruption interventions, which I think is fine, but we must also try to see how do we leverage 
on the other uh, 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 bodies and institutions to be able to uh, uh, address the issues of corruption. Uh, secondly, I think I would also uh, look at the issues of, uh, sorry that I'm also bringing in the concerns around debt, but you know that uh, the higher, and you know, as the corruption increases, it has, it has meant now, and it means that we have had to borrow so much. So what then is uh, opportunity from some of the international lenders, the World Banks, the IMF, to be able to add their voice to the uh, corruption that we are seeing? Some of the donors that continue to fund us as a country, uh, what is their position on the, the, the debt that we are seeing? But as I, uh, just moving out uh, away from that then is to just mention that I do not think the citizens themselves have also quite understood uh, the effect of, uh, of, of corruption to them. Because as we've said, sovereign power belongs to the people, but I haven't seen, and that is what we, we really try to bring the conscience of the people up. Because if you put uh, corruption majorly as a role for institutions like the ESCC and the likes, they can only do so much. And remember now we have around 48 governments. So the, the, the corruption, the anti-corruption uh, discussion needs to go to the very, very local levels so that then we also uh, can be able to address it in good time. Remember, the, uh, I have seen also the BBI making mention of strengthening the Office of the, control, uh, of the Auditor General. There has always been concerns that the Office of the Auditor General comes after the event. So how do we ensure then that there is timely, uh, uh, the, the, there is timely addressing of uh, public uh, wastage of public funds? And that is where we also have the Office of the Controller of Budget. So I would say, in a sense, looking at all these institutions, in terms of institutions, in terms of legal, in terms of policy, as a country, we are not at a very bad place. But the missing link, as uh, Titus, as I try to link with what Titus mentioned, for me would be the political will. You cannot legislate on political will. So this, we must find ways of going around it. How can the social contract and how can we leverage on elections which in our country we know goes either way, but how can we leverage on some of these things to be able to push the political uh, will to address, to address this? Uh, there was also the issue of the uh, uncoordinated approach that Tait has mentioned. I think the corruption that we continue to witness really is because of that uncoordinated approach. Looking at, say, the Auditor General's report, how much of that is discussed by the uh, you know, the park at the national level assembly and how do the parks at the county level also really look at the, uh, at the auditor general's report and after looking at them, what sanctions are there? Have they uh, forwarded some of these to the investigative agencies? So on the corruption, I, I, I would suggest that also our parliaments at both national and county level must understand the, the roles and the, the, the powers that they have and follow and use a lot of the reports that are coming from the oversight uh, institutions. Otherwise, then the oversight institutions are doing reports but are not finding their way and action on it. I would like to leave it there so that uh, we also have time to uh, the rest of the colleagues. Asante Sana. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Irene. I think uh, you have captured uh, it in a better way, in a brief better way also, trying to bring in issues around so many things that are being discussed and what has been left out from um, the question of revenue and the question uh, revenue sharing, coming to the debt question, and uh, that speaking to the gaps or the challenge that has been corruption to over taxation. And uh, it's clear that what we have is already rich. The question or the problem has been more on implementation. But nevertheless, as we are saying, uh, we've, we are already in this discussion and therefore it's also good to interrogate and see how best we can make these um, suggestions that are being put across in the BBI better going forward and as a people trying to make uh, use of our rights to speak up and also share out. I think um, what is coming out for me the national values question, I think is something we as citizens and even individuals, it's something that we need uh, to interrogate ourselves in our individual capacity. National values and ethics as a person as, and also as a people. 
There's also the issue of um, how do we bring uh, whatever is being proposed up there to the county level and even to the specific people who have been mandated with different uh, duties to undertake different uh, ideas. And we can already see, we have uh, good examples in some of the professionals. And that also speaks around the issue of um, the, the contract or the social contract first and also the contract that we have in our different engagement, whether it's Irene at a level of um, doing whatever she's doing, there is a contract that he has. We as a people, we are by two, and therefore we have pointed out that it is different with what we are seeing with our politicians or even uh, those representatives up there. Why the difference then is what we should, the difference is what we should be trying to bridge to ensure things are getting better, which speaks to the coordinated efforts of us as, a, as citizens, our coordinated efforts. I think we need to have a discussion around that because we've been having these discussions, but then how do we get to get this implementation done? How do we get to have the gaps that we are seeing in the, if you're talking about there being uh, store prosecution in the judiciary or even the goodwill from politicians, how do we get coordinated efforts by citizens to make sure we are making an impact on the fight against corruption and also on issues of leadership and integrity? And so I would like to throw it back to the participants. We have about uh, 23 minutes to have um, to bring out some of the issues that we feel have been missed by our presenters and also give out, share out our thoughts around uh, corruption and um, leadership. And maybe to start us off, I can see Paul Motuko uh, pointing out that corruption in Kenya has gone to another level which I think BBI has not captured. To me, this has become part of a Kenyan culture such that some acts of corruption are accepted by every Kenyan. For example, bribing a traffic office is, officer is normal to every Kenyan. I think this speaks to the issue of national values and ethics and what Irene started us off with. One nation or unity when we talk about tribalism that is taking us back to us feeling like we are being, there are those who are benefiting more than others. There are those who have a bigger share of our national resources than others. I think then that is where the problem even starts. And that's why I believe Irene has pointed out the conversation even in this document and even in our action, the government included is that it needs to appeal to citizens to have a sense of nationalism and that kind of ownership. Even the way that uh, revenue is shared, our representation up there, something that is able to do away with the feeling around um, the division that is there and even feeling like some are being left out. So I would like to open it up to anyone who might be having um, something to add or raise about what has been presented and generally what is being presented um, in the BBI document and the conversation that we're having around corruption and leadership. Thank you. Como I see Purity has a hand up, maybe Purity can go ahead. Okay, Purity, please. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, my name is Purity Jebol from Youth Alive Kenya. And I think just, uh, just to comment on what Irene has already shared uh, co comprehensively, uh, in terms of uh, uh, strengthening the anti-corruption uh, institutions, one of the things that the BBI proposal uh, report has actually proposed was uh, the formation of the World uh, Development Committees which I think will actually be cascading down uh, the oversight role from a uh, top level to the, to the grassroots. And I think that is the area that uh, in terms of uh, just enhancing public participation, 
from the beginning, but uh, at the but now at the Mwananchi level. But again, uh, the thing that the document has uh, not uh, brought out very clearly, it's in terms of the policy that will actually guide the formation of the, of the committees, which I think for us, it is very, very critical that as much as we want to, to have a transparent and, uh, and more open uh, processes, there's also need for the appointment on how the selection of the committees will actually look like. And, and, I, and I think that will be part of uh, just a strengthening the evolution aspect from the local uh, base. And I think another thing that again, Irene has just shared, uh, this week there was, uh, there was an article, uh, I think by the People's Daily, where uh, a county, maybe, uh, yes, it is there, the open, so I think I can just share that county, where uh, Kambu County uh, Assembly, there, there's a lot of uh, corruption allegation. So what is, uh, so if, if, the same, if the same oversight institution already has some corruption issues, I think there could be a better framing on how these uh, corruption issues are uh, should be conducted that uh, in terms uh, uh, are tackled with, but also I'm looking at, uh, we also need to start uh, strengthening, uh, apart from the citizen perspective, there's no need to also give more powers of uh, prosecution to the, to the exchequers so that they don't just do a, a, a very elaborative uh, um, audits, but it ends up at the parliament, then nothing is done to all the raised concern. I think we could also just do some little advocacy to ensure that the auditor general, the control of budget, they have the power to actually uh, prosecute counties and that uh, we get someone who will actually be responsible for, for any corruption uh, reports that will come from that county. Thanks about purity. I think that is deep. Looking at the World Development Committee and the question of, it's a good idea, definitely. I think I support that. But then how do we get there? The question is, how do we get there? And therefore, there is need to, for a guiding uh, policy uh, on how this will be formed to ensure we don't just move from one area to the other. Just the idea of shifting goalposts without any results, I think, it's important. There's also what uh, Irene had spoken about, what you, are, you and uh, you have reiterated. I'm sure it's not just about Kiambu County. It uh, cuts across most of the counties. Uh, it's more on the oversight that versus the uh, legislative uh, role of the assembly. When they, when um, it's about uh, the idea of uh, Mganga, Hajigangi. Uh, I think uh, we need something to guide us around that because we'll just be wasting our resources, having those guys sit up, get their allowances, and eventually they know there's nothing they would do about whatever they're investigating or following up. And I think we have seen this in some of the scandals that are coming up. We just have them sitting up for the session and um, nothing good comes out of it. Uh, and lastly, the question around we have seen the kind of work that is being done by the independent offices, the Office of the Controller of Budget, and also the Office of the Auditor General. And therefore, security is um, suggesting that we can extend more of uh, their roles to have, uh, to have them take up more powers to take actions around there. I think uh, that's something that can be shared out for discussions and input more when we get back to the main group. Uh, anyone else? Thanks about purity. Do we have someone else who need? Um... Anyone? Before I get it back to Titus to share with us some of the action points and uh, ideas that are coming out, I don't want to knock anyone out. Your feedback, concerns. Purity, I can see your hand still up. You want to add something all? 
No, I, let me let me just write it down. Okay, okay. Sorry. Do you have more feedback from um, participants? Yes. I think... uh, can, can I just make a general comment? Yes, Judith, that please go ahead. And uh, all the speakers that have actually enlightened us on uh, some of the key aspects in the BBI, yeah, that uh, touches on this topic. But, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking through as I listen to all the speakers and uh, it's a concern of every Kenyan that, uh, you know, co corruption, as much as we would want to, to, you know, revise the laws, come up with relevant policies, uh, it's all centered on individuals. And for any change to be affected, it has to start from the top. You know, it's about the behavior of people because it's something we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So what has been lacking in our country is enforcement. Laws are there. Huh? And I like the idea you brought up regarding relooking at our values and ethos. Yeah, it's about you and it's about me. We may give all kind of recommendations, but unless there is enforcement, I, I like what Purity has mentioned about the Auditor General. You know, they are toothless. They'll come up with these issues, but there's nothing much you'll do to the county governments, even the relevant government departments that are involved in corruption. So it has to be a collective move. Yeah, and those right at the top, yeah, can actually actualize this if the will is there. It's about the will. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Adot. Thanks, Adot, uh, Judith. Talking I'm about the will. Uh, yes, please. Sorry, I'm not seeing the icon to lift my hands, but uh, just allow one minute. I think when Judith mentioned it, it just brought to mind what she's mentioning that uh, for corruption and people to understand it, it really must start at the top. So when you have say uh, county officials saying they want immunity, what type of message is, just, is that sending to the entire country? Mm -hmm. So I think the leadership also, as they start making some of these demands, they, would th they should think what would be the ripple effect of this on citizens. So when a, a governor says I want immunity against corruption while in office, and what is the opportunity cost of that? When we give this person immunity for five years, within the five years, a child has lost a life, a mother has lost a baby because we have not invested in healthcare, maternal healthcare. Uh, so so I, I, I also would want to support her that the top level is also sending wrong messages and wrong signals to the country. So I th any attempt really, even when the government says they want to increase tax, we have now seen the digital tax for the youth, the people in the informal sector. So they should balance. If you say you want to increase tax, then also show us that you're becoming more stringent and trying to enforce the accountability mechanisms to ensure that our money will be safe. But if you are calling for immunity against corruption, at the same time, you want me as a Mamboga to, uh, to pay the full tax, I would rather pay a county official 1,000 as an informal payment, but save the other 4,000 that I would have paid because really I'm not seeing how the tax will flow back to me while we are giving immunity to some people. So I think the message at both levels, very top levels, should be very keen on enforcement and very keen on, on, on putting them, themselves out there for scrutiny. They must be above board if this message is to be followed by the people at the lower levels. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Irene and uh, Judith. If we hadn't uh, received the way forward and the action points from Titus, I think I would have ended the session there with those strong words on, it's about what picture the top management, top leadership is painting out there. It's the reason they are being called their leaders and they have been given that mandate. And I think key among, or the first thing that should be coming out on what uh, action points or even a suggestion we are giving. There is need for change in the behavior of the top leadership of 
this country and even the institutions that have been given the different mandate, if they can't um, give out um, clear message, leadership, then it they doesn't um, then even uh, warrant as having such kind of conversation around so many issues if the top leadership um, doesn't uh, show in behavior and in their action that indeed they want such kind of changes and they want the better for this nation. So I don't want to um, have um, to say more or discuss more around this because of time. We have about eight minutes, 30 seconds to hear from uh, Titus on some of the key issues that uh, we've been putting across when we get back to the other sessions and some of the suggestions. So thanks a lot uh, for your great um, contribution. My name is Samuel Komu. I work with Transparency International Kenya. Continue being good citizens and doing your part in ensuring we better this nation. Over to you, Titus. Thanks a lot, Komu. And much appreciation to colleagues and for the insights that uh, we are continuing to get on this discussion. Obviously, the discussion is not ending here. We are just but scratching the surface so that we can find a way to continue this robust conversation. Um, throughout the discussions, there are quite a bit of some aspects that uh, coming out and I've noted some of these and they are not conclusive. I will uh, pardon me if some things keep to my attention. I would request that um, before we are um, <clears throat> required back on the main plenary, we can as well still gather a lot of those. Uh, but uh, a few of those that have captured as some of the um, takeaways from the conversation include one, uh, just appreciation that even as we strengthen these other investigative bodies and also um, strengthening our institutions, especially at the level of what we have seen a lot emphasis on from the BBI report, the prosecution and the DCI, I think um, Irene brought it out that there is also need for us to reflect on uh, the judiciary because uh, it beats it beats logic to strengthen uh, these investigative bodies, but where it will end eventually is weakened, is not helping us much. I think that is a point that is coming out. Uh, the other point and the takeaway that is coming out from the reflection is that largely to a large extent, we fairly have a very robust policy legal uh, framework to help us stand the tide against corruption. The question and the challenge is implementation of these robust laws and therefore we are not coming from a weak position as far as the fight against corruption is concerned. And that is something that has been noted um, throughout the discussion. So I think we are sort of agreeing that if there could be a lot more emphasis on implementation of the robust policy and legal framework that we have as far as fighting corruption is concerned, we would be making a lot of significant steps in terms of tying the, tying, uh, turning the tide against corruption. Um, the other discussion that we've had robustly, again, still is, is on judiciary. Uh, what we noted about uh, Bootsman, um, there is a, a real concern and fear that that will be clawing back on the gains of strengthening judiciary. And that is something that we need to continuously watch out for and see how best we can ensure that judiciary is strengthened because the fight against corruption really needs to ensure that we strengthen all these institutions across board. Uh, that is a concern that has been raised up. Uh, another area and another takeaway um, is on uh, ensuring that we do not forget the place of the public in the fight against corruption. There is a feeling that there is a bit of more attention on these um, investigative bodies and these other institutions, but nothing much tangible and also exciting probably around uh, strengthening or working with the public and including the comments that have came from additional participants, I think Ruth and uh, Purity, uh, further strengthen this bit of discussion that if this need in which 
the public through public participation and these other mechanisms need to be put in place so that the public are given a lot of attention in terms of helping in the fight against corruption. So I think that component of the question of the public is coming strongly in terms of our reflections around the proposals that we have noted. Um, there is, there is, there is, there is an observation that uh, whereas there has been some proposals around uh, public participation, um, there isn't much that we can ride home about in terms of the details. That also goes to the question also that Irene posed around uh, what is said to be strengthening this uh, prosecution. It is just left as, as that without much more details. And that leaves us to uh, ask a lot of other questions on how exactly are these strengthenings going to be done. There is scanty information to that effect from the report that you have we have we have gone through so far and, and then also there is also a question around um ensuring that given the kind of uh, sophistication that we see around the fight or around corruption which has gone beyond our borders uh, there is need to be sure that as we reflect on steps and initiatives that needs to be taken in the bbi we pay attention to uh, how then do we uh, frame aspects that can cater for the, the manner in which corruption is currently um, getting sophisticated and going multi-dimensional and multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, in nature and that is an area that has been noted as one that is not being paid attention to from, from the report and from our reflection. And then the other issue and takeaway from this that came from our discussions is the question of political goodwill. And this is also tied to the picture that our leadership should be portraying right from the national, from the top level in terms of uh, fighting corruption. Uh, the question of goodwill came out uh, through, through the discussions and also from the reflections and also from the review of the report that uh, it is a critical component. And that is one thing that needs to be um, entrenched in our reflections on how we are going to ensure that that is done together with the question of the leadership also showing a good example. And I think uh, lastly, there has been quite a bit of discussions around uh, the national values and ethos as a significant area that will ensure that uh, all the citizens make a contribution in the fight against corruption, because a lot of this starts from um, making individual contribution at individual level. And that has to do with transforming and looking at our ethos and, and national values. And that is something that we have also reflected on. Uh, from looking at the BBI report, uh, they have also to a large extent emphasized on this from what they were saying in terms of the policies that needs to be developed uh, further and also from the administrative proposals that they gave on the report. But the question and the challenge is it's not really very new we have been singing that a lot more. So I think I also concur that whereas BBI has really emphasized on the question of national ethos, values, and really uh, educating the public, uh, there is no particular uh, new thing in terms of how we are going to innovatively address that bit of, of question. And I think the other areas that were mentioned is... Um, Titus, you have 40 seconds. Oh, and we'll sorry. be getting back to the other session. So maybe you can highlight. Yes, so just I was concluding, Komu, uh, just the, the issue of the ward level committee has also been highlighted as an area that could be a, a good step, just ensuring that uh, the, 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 the further um, framework on how that will be done is critical. Otherwise, thank you so much. I hope that captures the true spirit of our discussions and, and we'll be able to share back in the main session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Titus, and everyone who has uh, managed to join us. We get back to the main group, and we could have an opportunity to share more on this. Have a good afternoon.